Hello everyone. Hopefully, um, I'm, I think I'm one minute late or early, so I'll just wait for um, people to come in and uh, and see how many are going to watch this video. Uh, if you miss it, um, it it'll definitely be in my archive. So, how you doing, Elaine? We're going to be in Revelations three one through. Six. How are we doing, brother Joshua? How are you doing? I don't know how to. Uh, are you an uh, apostle, prophet, <laughs> teacher? I, I I've seen you uh, do about all five, so I I don't know how to address you, sir. But you are a man of God and definitely on fire. So um, glad to see you here. Uh, it's nice to have you here, Elaine. Uh, we're going to be in Revelations 3, 1 through 6. Uh, Revelations uh, 3, 1 through 6. We're going to be talking about the uh, Church of Sardis. And uh, I'm really excited about this one because uh, I say that, I think I, th I think I say that on every single one, but this one is really good because uh, we see some hidden things that, that come forth if we just understand. You're just like me. I just, I just call me Mike. Praise God, Hallelujah! It's it's I'm gl I'm glad that you're here, sir. But um, um I'm excited about your um your uh, your uh, event that you have coming up, man. It, it looks powerful. I wish I wish I lived closer. Praise God, praise God. All right, well, let's just get started, and uh, you know, people can come in when they have a chance, but uh, we're going to get going with this. Uh, it's, we're going to be in Revelations 3, 1 through 6, and um, it says this, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who hold the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, he says. This is Jesus speaking. We always have to understand that when we read these letters, this is Jesus speaking to the church. He says, I know your reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. Praise God. Just I, I, I like to be among those people. They, they will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life. Now, this is a threat. He says that I will never blot out his name. Whose name? The one who's dressed in white and who overcomes. The ones that, that he have found faithful. If he's threatening to blot out a name, that means that he's more than capable of blotting out a name. He says, I will... I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Praise God. This is the fifth of the seven letters sent by Jesus through the apostle John. So much of what is said is a direct reference to what has happened in that city. For the church has taken on the characteristics of its surroundings. And we're seeing that here in America today where, where the church is trying to adapt and be um, uh, uh, likable. And they're, they're adapting to the, its surroundings and they're, they're, they're becoming like their city or they're becoming like the people around them. The Lord wanted to remind them that their fate will be the same as that city. Sardis was literally built on a hill. Sardis was literally built on a big hill, like a mountain. It was a high area surrounded on three sides by, by uh, walls about a hundred. Oh, I'm sorry, a thousand five hundred feet in height, fifteen hundred feet high, were the sides of the walls of three of the walls. The only way to get into the town was to come in from the south 
up the hill. It, it was set uh, as a very strategic town. You, you were pretty much safe in this town. The city, because of its natural defensive capabilities, regarded itself as secure. This will preach, but I don't have time. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people in the church who feel like they are secure. Uh, the city is the same way. It was one of the greatest cities of the ancient world in the 6th century before Christ. In the 6th century before Christ, it had a king, Croesus, who was known throughout the world. He made war against the Persians in Cyrus. Croesus thought he was safe in, in Sardis for the gates were shut and he knew that it was impossible for an army to scale the walls. So while he slept, some daring soldiers of, uh, of Cyrus scaled the walls, slipped into the city, opened the gates, and the army of Cyrus took the city. It just, they just took the city. And when the king woke up in the morning, he found out that he was no longer the king. By stealth, at night, the thief had come, right? As a, a person climbing those walls could have easily been stopped by one person perched on top, one watchman on top of a wall, one person standing declaring that, that, that the thief is coming, but no one was posted because they thought that they were safe. They thought they were okay. The city felt that it was secure, but they were wrong. It's striking how history repeats itself. For nearly four centuries later, in the year of uh, 218, Sardis had regained their political strength and, and uh, a military might. And once more, it felt secure because it was so safely surrounded. And they felt that they were safe. They were secure. Again, at night, while the city slept, 15 men scaled the walls, opened the city gates, and the army rushed in, and the city was taken once again. Sardis was a city that was living in the past. It thought it had a, a future, but it did not. It felt like it was secure, and it was not. The Lord comes to this church, and He sees so much in the church that is like this city. He first of all presents himself to the church as he has presented himself to every other church. He reminds the church of his character. In Revelations 3.1 he says, I am he who has the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits of God. The description of the Holy Spirit as the seven spirits of God, it, it can mean one of two things. Things. It can mean a, a reference to Isaiah 11:2 in describing the Spirit as He is existing in the ministry of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon Him, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, and might. These are seven descriptions that are given in Isaiah 11. It may be that it is uh, what the Lord is saying here. I am the one who possesses the Spirit. It is very uh, significant to, the, to a church that is uh, at the point of death that it's the Spirit alone that can bring it back to life. Therefore, the Lord wants this church to keep in mind that He is the bringer of the Spirit. He has the Spirit. No other reminder could be more pointed than when we are on the verge of spiritual death ourselves in a in a backslidden state the one who uh, the the one hope that we have the one hope is that we might be touched again by the spirit of god holy spirit can bring back to life what we thought was dead it is the spirit who gives life hallelujah it, it, it is God who breathed in man the breath of life, and it is Jesus who at his resurrection breathed upon his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit in John 20, 22. And it is the same Lord who says to the church at this point of death and to Christians at the point of death, I am the one who has the Spirit. 
He is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit and with fire, is what the scripture says. The sevenfold spirit may also describe simply the fact that there are seven churches and the same spirit is present in each of the churches. He is equal as powerfully, he is equally as powerful in each of the churches. He has all the power. He has all the demonstration. He is the same spirit represented in all the churches. The Lord says that not only does he have the spirit, therefore the ability to bring this dead church back to life, but in Revelations 3.1, he also says he holds the stars in his hand. He holds the stars in his hand. We talked about, uh, we, we, we talked too about uh, what these seven stars mean. He holds the pastors and the leadership in his hand. He holds us in his hand. I think the problem at Sardis was the church began holding itself in high regard. I'm going to say that again. I, I think the problem at Sardis was it, it, it felt like it held itself in high regard. The Lord is getting through to this church and saying, Look, remember whose you are. It is I who hold you. Remember who you are. Remember where you came from. It is I who hold you. Praise God. So the Lord is coming, representing his character to this church. Usually before he finds something to blame, he finds something good to say about it. But here at Sardis, to the church as a whole, there is no good word of approval. Boy, I hate to be in those shoes. On the other hand, there are few who have not soiled their garments, he says. That is a reference to the fact that there are some in the church who have not partaken of the world's sins. They have not partaken of the world's sins. Um, this is a contrast to the other churches who ha uh, have looked at where the correction was being addressed to the minority of the church, uh, which uh, were walking away from the Lord. But the majority of the church as a whole was following Christ. Here, the majority have fallen away, and the Lord can only commend a few. I am here to say God will always have his remnant, a remnant will, who will not soil their garments, a remnant who will not live in a sin-fallen world and partake of the sin, a, 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 a remnant church who's, who's, who loves the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, body, and strength, a, a church that's going to hold uh, fast to the uh, obedience of what the Word of God says. God says, I'm pleased with those people. I'm pleased with those guys because they have not soiled their garments like the other others in the church. So he must bring to this church a correction. He must bring to this church a correction. He says in Revelations 3, 1, I know your works. You have the name of being alive, but you are dead. You have a name of being alive, but you are truly dead. Here is a church whose reality does not match up with its reputation. Come on now. Perhaps it was running good numbers. Maybe it was a mega church. Perhaps there was a lot of wealthy people in the church who had uh, uh, power and prestige. Perhaps they were known in the community for all their good deeds. But the Lord is exam examining this church on the basis of its relationship to himself personally. And he says, in my sight, you're dead. You're not alive at all. You don't have the spirit of God dwelling in you. You're dead. Uh, we must remember there's nothing better organized than a graveyard. I'm going to say that again, and you guys can use it if you want. There is nothing, <laughs> there is nothing better organized than a graveyard, but there's very little life there. Praise God. Here's Sardis, an organized church lacking spiritual life in God's presence. Here is the church operating without the power of God. Do you know any churches like that? So we see that it's possible for a church to thrive outwardly, to thrive and look like it's alive, but inside it's dead. It's even more striking to see that this could happen even in the age in which the apostles were still living. The apostles were still living when this church was thriving, but was dead. While John is still living, there is a church that has gone away from Christ. 
Praise God. Man, just to think about that. We sometimes think that if the apostles were here today, if, if the, the 11 or the 12 apostles were here today, if they were only present in the church today, the church would be alive and well and flourishing. But it's not so. Here's a church that had fallen into death, into death only one generation after Jesus Christ. As I try to ponder what this death was like, I think I could describe it in this way. Follow me here. This church, when they gathered for worship, they sang the songs, but the songs they sang were the songs in the hymnal or on the screen, but the songs uh, it was not from the heart. They just read uh, up uh, and they followed along. Or, or maybe the songs weren't, uh, the people that were leading the worship weren't f- truly filled themselves, but they were just singing a song and they were talented, but not filled with the Holy Ghost. It was a worship It was a worship in terms of performance instead of worship out of a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know who the true people are who got into the presence of God and can lead a congregation into the presence. You know the people who have a prayer life. You can see it. You can see it by their fruit. You know the people that can get a hold of God and can pray because they've been in his presence all week. When the prayers were prayed, they prayed prayers of duty. They prayed, they were prayers of beauty. But the, those kinds of prayers don't move the heart of God. Hear me, people. You can, you can put up an eloquent uh, 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 prayer if you want, but if you, if you haven't been in the presence of God, it doesn't move him. You have to have a current relationship with him. When the gifts of ministry were given, they were given more from the standpoint of this is what we ought to do, but the ministry was not being done unto the least of these, my brethren. It was not being done as unto the Lord. Praise God. In the, uh, in the language of the Old Testament, all of the worship of this church stopped short in the outer courts. <sighs> Nothing ever reached the inner place. Nothing ever reached the Holy of Holies. Nothing ever reached uh, God's heart and satisfied Him. So in Revelations 3.1, the Lord says to this church, everybody thinks you're alive. You're, you're putting on a good show. You're drawing the crowds and you're, and you're bringing in the money. Congratulations. But I know that you're dead. You're just pretending. You're the great pretender. You are just pretending. He's not only, he, only, he not only tells them that they're dead, but he also tells them that their performance doesn't match their intentions. He tells them to wake up. Wake up. Awaken in the scripture does not simply mean to start looking around with your eyes to open, right? It means get to work correcting things. Revelations 3 2 says, and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. He says, wake up, but just don't wipe the sleep from your eyes. Start correcting the problem. Man, this speaks today. Here's his way of saying to the church, you have a way of beginning things and not finishing them. Nothing you do is complete. That's what happens when you're half-hearted service. So take what you have now and get to work completing it is what he's saying. And this goes not only for the church, but this also rings true as individuals. So where does your reputation pass the actual reality of your life? These are hard questions, but these are good questions to ask why we're still here. Are you alive but dead toward the things of God? Are you going to church but going out through the motions and and out of duty and not because of a relationship with Jesus? I wonder how many families, marriages, and people who are here and who are listening are, are known as Christians. But if you were tried, there would not be enough evidence to convict you. There would not be enough evidence of, of, uh, of outwardly deeds that works to convict you of being a Christian. Everything looks great on the outside. You're, you're the poster child for spirituality. You lead the prayer team. You hold a Bible study. But when you look into the mirror, you realize that you aren't even on the same road with God and where he wants you to be. You've been faking going through the motions, saving, saying the right words, singing the right songs, but your heart is far from him, is what the scripture says. 
The relationship of prayer is gone uh, out of your life. Uh, the idea of the family being together in terms of worship is absent. Before others, uh, th- there you you hold up a good front, but it's absent. You have a name for being alive, but inside there is no there is there is a spiritual deadness. The Lord has three words for us today. And it's not words of condemnation. He, he wants to build us up. He wants to warn us. He wants to wake us up, church. He wants to wake up the fivefold again to, so we might go after our first love. But he has words of correction here for all of us. It was these three words, repair the altar. We need to repair the altar. We need to go back to what worked. We need to go back to the old wells. We need to redig some of these old wells that worked. We, some of this new stuff that we're trying to bring in isn't relevant at all to the Word of God. It's relevant to, to, to bringing in more people and bringing in more revenue and bringing in and, and, and being a bless me club. But God is not mocked. He is not happy. He wants us to go back and start doing the, the first works of what we've been called to do. There is another word, uh, another Old Testament phrase which was used continually as good kings came into power after a period of idolatry and fallen away from the Lord. This would show God that they were serious about their relationship with him. And in essence, that is what's being said to this church today. Um, The Lord continues with his correction. He says in Revelations 3, 3, he says, (laughs) he says, remember, remember, what you have been, uh, what you have seen and heard. Remember, remember what you have seen and heard. Continually call to mind this abnonation which has been given to me or by me, and not only continue to call it to mind, but keep it and repent. Remember and repent. Repent's a dirty word today. Not too many people want to hear that in services. Not too many people want to hear that in messages from uh, evangelists or pastors or apostles or prophets or teachers. They don't want to hear that word repent any longer, but that's what needs to be done. The church needs to get on its face once more. We don't need to advertise chili feeds and concerts, but we need to go back to the altar, grab a hold of the horns of the altar and hold on and pray and, and, and repent for this lack heartedness that's been shown uh, just because someone is or isn't in in washington dc and, and he is or isn't a christian doesn't matter one bit it's our responsibility as a church to remember and repent and go back after the things of god it's striking as you look at this in the greek that the word remember is in the present tense it is in the present tense It says, go on remembering. Don't just remember once and forget. Go on remembering. Go on keeping in mind that which I am telling you to do is what the Lord is saying. The word keep is also in the present tense. Keep what I have told you to do. But the word repent is in the past tense. He says, do it all at once. Don't change inch by inch. Don't make a decision or determination by by." by little small measures, but just jump and just repent. You know, I, I, I heard a pastor say, and I don't know if he's changed his position, but he says that, that his opinion on a certain sin is, 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 is revolving. It's, it's, uh, um, it's evolving is what he said. We don't repent in, 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 in that kind of a spirit. We go all in. We say, God, I'm sorry for being uh, sinful. I'm sorry for falling into this sin. I'm sorry for, 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 uh, for not having a, a heart after you. We have to just repent and just get it over with. The Lord then gives a challenge to this church, to the people that are in it. He says, he who conquers shall be clad thus in white garments. You shall be clothed in white garments. When we think of a a formal occasion, we think of white. White is a dress of beauty. We don't wear uh, it very often because it easily gets soiled or dirty, especially when you have kids. I don't ever wear white with my four-year-old and my two-year-old because I will have stains on it. it, it it's brought out on special occasions. I, I would love to preach in a white suit, but that ain't going to happen either. In the ancient world, to wear white could be a symbol of, of three things, uh, of the three things that I found. It could be a symbol of a uh, festivity such as a wedding or a banquet. 
It was a dress that was worn in times of victory. When the Romans came back from a triumph, the whole city would be dressed in white. It was uh, uh, it also was a sign for purity, purity. The Lord is saying all these things about our walk with him, all those things he's saying about our walk with him, all those three things, he will give us that garment, which will never be soiled again. Praise God. The Lord is saying this, and this is, this is found in, uh, 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 Mike Bell one, one, when, when you're with me forever, it's going to be a festival. It's going to be victory. It's going to be, uh, you're going to be pure and spotless to him who overcomes. I will give this white garment that will never be soiled or spotted again. We learn later in revelations that the saints are those who have a garment that has been made with pure white through washing it in the blood of the Lamb. Our lives are laundered in blood, and it becomes white. (laughs) What a strange uh, reversal of colors here. But it is the Lord's way of saying, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sin and makes us pure and victorious in the sight of God. It further says to the Sardis church and to those who are still remaining faithful in him in Revelations 3, 5, it says he will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Remember, John's writing to a church. He's writing to the church. He's not writing to the world. He's not writing to the sinner. He's writing to the church, a church which was at the point of death. The Lord is now saying in Revelations 3, 5, I will not blot out your name uh, out of the book of life. This phrase, the book of life, has kind of a fascinating history in Scripture. It's first found in Exodus 32, 32, where Moses cries, Please forgive their sin, but if not, then blot me out of the book of life or the book you have written. In other words, Moses is willing to trade his place in eternity for the sake of the salvation of his people. We need more Moseses. We need more people, more men of God to stand up and declare, God, God, just take me. Leave these people, God. Forgive them. But if you have to, blot out me and, and, and keep them safe, Father God. Where's the passion behind the pulpits? Where's the passion behind the men of, and women of God? It's used again in Psalm 69, 28, where the psalmist cried to God to blot out the names of the wicked from the book he has written. In Luke 10, when the disciples came back from their first mission of preaching the gospel and they're rejoicing that even the demons are subject to them, the Lord says, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's found in Luke 10, 20. And Paul in Philippians 4.3 talks about his fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. We're told in Hebrews 12.23 that believers have their names enrolled in heaven. Praise God. And in Revelations 13.8 and 17.8, we are told that the names were written before the foundations of the world. In ancient times, each city had what it was called a registry of its citizens. Follow me here. In ancient times, each city had what it was called a registry of of all of its citizens. When a citizen died, his name was removed from the registry. Or when a citizen committed a bad enough crime, his name was also removed. Also, when the, uh, someone was born into that city, their name was written. Using this kind of language that the people of Sardis would completely and totally understand, the Lord says, I will not blot out your name unless you come back to life. Let me rephrase that. He says, I will blot out your name unless you come back to life. Jesus is saying, listen, if you are dead, I'm going to erase you from the book. It's interesting that a threat from the Lord can become uh, an item uh, of a theological debate, uh, like once saved, always saved. Yeah, I went there. I went there. If you hold, uh, if you hold uh, to eternal security, you will have to take eternal security in its loosest form. 
which simply says that once you've dedicated your life to Jesus Christ, you can never be lost, even if you live like the devil every day of your life after you were saved. But all through Scripture, that is not what salvation is. You will also have to tell Jesus that his threat to blot out your name isn't what he actually meant, and he was mistaken. Hear me, believers are secure in their salvation. All believers are secure in their salvation, but Scripture gives no comfort to the backslider, except for the comfort that comes through repentance. The thing that Jesus told this church to do, remember and repent, become alive again, is what Jesus says. Clearly, those who have been saved, this is written to the church after all, to believers, right, can become dead like in Sardis. Spiritually dead believers are not secure or safe. He doesn't tell them you're spiritually dead, but you can think you're lucky stars, you're saved, so you're good either way. No, he says he will blot your name out if you remain dead, spiritually dead. So go argue that with him. I'm not going to argue this this point with anyone um, because I, I have a I have a, 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 a I'm under the understanding that that if you want to go out and live in the devil's house and expect God to pay your rent, you're not saved anyway. You 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 bought something called fire insurance. You were you were con convicted, but you weren't converted. This is not salvation, people. Praise God! I know I'm going to get some junk on this. Um, Go argue it with Jesus. I'm not going to argue it with you. The challenge on the bright side is to have your name in the book of life. To hear what has been said and not just hear but act on it. Praise God. It's very dangerous to hear these words and not take action. It's very dangerous to hear the words of God and not take action. When scripture is speaking to you, you must take action. The Lord never promises that he will continue to keep on dealing with you. When he speaks, we must listen and then put action to what you have just heard. When uh, we can look all good while we study and appear like we are uh, taking it all in, or we can uh, take it in deeply and then allow God's word to change us into his image. That's what we're called to do be changed into the image of God Jesus said that we are to examine ourselves not in condemnation but with an excitement that I can be more like him praise God that's what it's all about being changed into the image of God not not being uh, converted into a better mic but being converted into the image of God he must increase while I decrease when he becomes strong I become weak when I'm weak he's strong you know I become more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus all these things are are put to death that that I want and I become alive in him that's what it's about we can become more like him. I heard it said that I would rather be in the ha hands of an angry God than not in his hands at all. I heard that. I, I, I love that saying. I would rather be in the hands of an angry God than not be in his hands at all. So the question we must ask ourselves in this teaching is very simple. And we must ask this with, with a humble heart, knowing that, that God is not in it to beat us about and, and to beat us down, but he wants to, to encourage us today to wake up. You know, if Sardis would have had somebody standing on the wall and warn the people who were sleeping, the city would never have been taken. God is looking for people to stand up, be watchmen on the walls, and declare the word of God. Say, thus saith the Lord. And and doesn't matter if you have a, 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 a large friends. Uh, <laughs> I lose about three or four friends a week on Facebook. But praise God, they were never my friends to begin with. Praise God, we have to declare the word of God. Do it in love, absolutely. We must do it in love. But we all have an obligation to hear and obey, is what the word of God says. So, are we alive toward others, but dead toward God? The Lord 
in this, in this teaching says, repent and be alive, be made alive again. Praise God. Hallelujah. You guys be blessed. I pray that God is with you, that God has, has encouraged you in this teaching, that you, you are strengthened in your most holy faith and you go out and you step out in faith. You step out in obedience and do the work of the Father. Time is short and we must have workers out in the field doing what God has called us to do. I will not be on next week. Next Tuesday, I will be in Mexico. So pray for me. Keep me in your prayers. And if you feel like you, uh, you want to uh, help come alongside this ministry and become partners with us or give toward this, this, uh, this uh, trip to Mexico, um, uh, there will be a uh, donate button somewhere after we're done. But you guys be blessed. I love you so much. Be encouraged and strengthened and go out and do the Lord's business. God bless you.